Greetings, welcome to our Monday, Thursday worship service. One year ago, this was the first of the services that we do as a building that we had to cancel. We since then have had a variety of worship opportunities using this feature, this Zoom opportunity for us to worship not only here in the building, but for our deployed staff and for our friends at the Oklahoma Methodist Foundation. So in some ways, like every local church, this has been one of those many pivots that we have done to continue to draw together as a staff. Of course, part of our goal over a year ago was for us to worship, to lunch together, and then to deploy, to do ministry projects and service in the name of Jesus all around our community with our various mission partners. And we're not able to do that this year. As they say, maybe next year, maybe we'll be able to do that in another year, maybe even sooner for those of us who are in local churches doing service. So it is a unique time, but is one, it is one that we're thankful that you've set aside now to worship with us. I'm thankful today to Judy Horn and to Kevin Wilkinson, who always lead us so beautifully in music, and to our preacher and worship leader today, the Reverend Daryl Cates, who is the Director of Conference and Church Relations for the Oklahoma Methodist Foundation, a longtime pastor in our annual conference, and a friend. I know that you'll be blessed today by his words. Let us center our hearts and minds now with these. Come and remember the love of Jesus. Gathered at the table with his friends, we come to receive from Christ the bread of life and the cup of blessing. Come receive the tender service Christ offers each of us. We come to receive the challenge of the new commandment to love one another. Come and contemplate the many temptations of a world that would entice us like Judas to betray the trust of a suffering God. Come to travel the way with Jesus of the cross so that our Easter Alleluia will take on new meaning. Let us worship together and reflect upon the life of Christ that we might remember what discipleship may cost and what it may reap. for all 
cross a thief was supposed to pay. And Jesus had come into the world to steal every heart away. Yes, Jesus had come into the world to steal every heart away. Please join me in prayer. Father, in these moments together, may the words of my mouth, the thoughts and meditation of our very lives together be acceptable in your sight, our strength and our redeemer. And may you do, Lord, that which only you can do. Take the written and spoken word and make it for us a word of life. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. It's such a privilege to be present here today to represent your friends and colleagues at the Oklahoma Methodist Foundation and to uh, be a part of this Monday Thursday time together. I want to start with a scripture from Colossians chapter 2 verses 13 through 15 from the message version. These words, when you were stuck in your old sin dead life, you were incapable of responding to God. God brought you alive right along with Christ. Think of it. All sins forgiven, the slate wiped clean, the old arrest warrant canceled and nailed to Christ's cross. He stripped all the spiritual tyrants in the universe of their sham authority at the cross and marched them naked through the streets. We are here today during this season, a special week of remembrance, the week that shook the world for a Monday Thursday service, celebrating the full, perfect, and complete sacrifice of Jesus in the sacrament of communion together. We will be considering the horrific events Jesus endured leading to his death on the cross. My background growing up was in a much different tradition that celebrated the triumphal entry on Palm Sunday with fanfare and fervor, but then nothing happened at the church in the week in between until we returned Easter morning in our Easter uh, best to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. It was kind of spiritual whiplash. Even though a fourth to a third of each gospel covers the events that took place in this final week of Jesus' life, it was a mystery to me why the adoring crowd shouting Hosanna, Hosanna could a few days later pick a murderer Barabbas and shout crucify him, crucify him of Jesus, leading to his scourging, degrading and humiliating abuse and the horrors of crucifixion. The events and meaning of the last week of Jesus' life culminating in his death on the cross was shrouded in mystery there was much I didn't know or understand. It was enough for me at the time to remember and believe John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have life everlasting. And the affirmation again from Colossians, Colossians 1, 19 and 20. For in Jesus, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him, God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. It was much later that I read through the whole Bible on my own and came to see God's mighty act of salvation woven all the way through. Cardinal Jean-Marie Lustiger was Archbishop of Paris from 1980 till 2005. He tells the story of three boys who wanted to play a trick on a local parish priest. 
by taking turns going to the confessional and confessing all sorts of wild and imaginary things and then running away laughing. The first two boys had their fun and the third boy who happened to be Jewish took his turn. Before he could run away, the priest said, I give you a penance to do. Go to the other end of the church and look full into the face of the figure hanging on the cross and say three times, you did this for me and I don't give a damn. The boy managed to say it once and the second time, but the words caught in his throat, the third, the reality of what God did for him swept over him. And from that moment on, he became a follower of Jesus. Cardinal Lustiger shared the reason I know this story is I was that young man. In 1 Corinthians 15 verses one through three, these words are written for us. Now I remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, of which you in turn received and which you also stand, through which also you are being saved, if you hold only to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you have come to believe in vain, for I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins, in accordance with the scriptures. My intention in the limited time we have this morning is not to review the theories of the atonement, the explanations of what we think God was doing through the cross, but bear witness to that statement that Jesus died for us according to the scripture. The Bible is the story of how God created us for relationship and how that relationship was damaged and broken and God's efforts to deliver and save and restore that relationship beginning in the Old Testament and continuing through the New. All four of the Gospels are the story of God working through the birth, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus to save. In Luke chapter 22, we see the Last Supper is based on the Passover meal, celebrating God's deliverance. That evening, Jesus took the cup after supper that every Jewish boy and girl knew was the cup of Moses, the cup of redemption. And Jesus said, this is a new covenant in my blood. In the Gospel of John, Jesus is presented as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And in John's timeline, Jesus is crucified at the same time that the Passover lambs are being slaughtered, not just as a sacrifice for sin, but to be a sign of God's deliverance from slavery and bondage. There was a little boy who loved when his mom would read to him from the children's Bible storybook. It was written in simple language and illustrated with colorful drawings, following the gospels and telling the story of Jesus' life. He found the accounts fascinating, but he got very still when told of the betrayal, the trial, and how they nailed Jesus to a cross along with two robbers. His face darkened, tears filled his eyes, and he finally burst out angrily, oh mama, if only God had been there, he wouldn't have let them do it to him. But that's the glory of the story. God was there in a way that's difficult to adequately express. God was there at the cross. God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, we are told in 2 Corinthians. God's love, God's pain, God's suffering, God's sacrifice, which made it possible. God's love shown in Christ's ultimate identification with sinners where God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. But friends, we limit the gospel when we confine the effects of the cross to the forgiveness and cleansing of our sins, as great as that is. Dr. Frank Lake, 
a theologian and pioneer in clinical theology, outlines the significance of the cross with a Christian counselor. In his research and book, he said his understanding of the cross is that it deals with evils we have suffered as well as the sins we have committed. In the cross, Jesus identifies not only with the guilty sinner, but also with the innocent sufferers in the world. As we need to be reconciled to God through forgiveness, but as sufferers, we need to be reconciled to God by clear evidence that God cares and shares and understands our suffering. Christ's cross and resurrection is God's gracious answer to both needs. In the cross, Christ became the atonement for sin and the victim of suffering at the hands of others. In the resurrection, he ultimately triumphed over both. In the cross and resurrection, all the powers of evil which operate in the shadows behind the chosen sin and innocent suffering are defeated and dethroned. If we leave this aspect of the cross out of our preaching, teaching, and counseling, we are failing to tell hurting people what they desperately need to hear. And that is a God who came and suffered with us. And that is in Jesus, the healer of our hurts is the feeler of our hurts, is a word much needed by victims of molestation exploitation, abuse. What word from the cross could speak to victims of sexual abuse? It is that Christ in humiliation and disgrace identifies with victims of shame and nakedness. Corey Ten Boom, who survived uh, death camps under Nazi Germany, said that she in her experience in the concentration camp, felt helpless, exposed, humiliated. She found in Christ's experience of crucifixion, of being nakedly displayed and humiliated and suffering for others, that God did care for her. She experienced reassurance and strength that helped her to endure and to overcome. In Jesus, we also find the one wipes away our tears, weeps with us. The question of all who suffer in innocence is why? Lives are crippled and crushed by the sins of others, resulting in seas of doubt about a God of love. When we study the suffering and death of Christ, we are pushed to ask why at every detail. But in his passion and death, Jesus suffered every possible injustice, although totally innocent. God did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, is the witness found in Romans 8. And in the first sermon Peter preached, recorded in Acts, we find this statement, this man Jesus was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, and you with the help of wicked men put him to death by nailing him to the cross. Jesus came and suffered as we suffer. He experienced humiliation. Humiliation, the pain of attacks on our own self-worth. Attacks that violate a person resulting in distortion of identity, attitudes, and behaviors. Leaving a deep sense of shame, guilt, low self-esteem that all need to be healed. Jesus knew what it was to be disgraced and defenseless, powerless, vulnerable. The writer of Hebrews makes this statement. So also Jesus and suffered and died outside the city gates to make his people holy by means of his own blood. So let us go out to him outside the camp and bear the disgrace he bore. Jesus knew what it was to feel forsaken. From the cross, 
he cites Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We need to read this and understand it in the context of the whole Psalm to see God's provision and plan and purpose in our forsakenness. A statement after his death was that Jesus descended into hell. It is a statement of faith in what Jesus did. And for those whose life is a living hell, there is no place we can go or others can take us beyond God's love for us. Another statement found in Hebrews affirms that in Jesus, we don't have a priest who is out of touch with our reality. He's been through weakness and testing, experienced it all, all but the sin. So let us walk right up to him and get what he is so ready to give. Take the mercy, accept the help. As Michael Card's song, Why, reminds us, for Jesus has come into the world to steal every heart away. Amen. How appropriate that we get to remember and celebrate together the meal that Jesus celebrated with his disciples the last night on this earth. A meal that called to remembrance God's mighty act of salvation and delivering people out of slavery and out of bondage, out of suffering and humiliation, out of brokenness and despair. Prayer is that as we celebrate these elements together, that God will do again what he has done before. I invite you to the Lord's table, a table prepared long ago in which we remember God's love and presence in coming for us. We acknowledge in our confession our brokenness and that we have often um, not been listening in our suffering we have become deaf to God's presence. May these emblems of God's love renew faith and courage and hope. On the night that Christ was betrayed, he took bread and giving thanks. Blessed art thou, Lord God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. And he broke it reminding us that this had become his body broken for us. After supper, he took the cup. Blessed art thou, Lord God, King of the universe, who brings forth the fruit of the vine. And he said, from now on, this cup of redemption, this cup of deliverance is a new cup in my blood poured out for you and for many take and drink the body of Christ for you because he loves you the cup of Christ for you because he loves you you are the body of Christ amen
angelicus, fit panis hominum, dat panis celicus figuris As I mentioned earlier, if we were together, we would be to lunch and then off site to do mission work. But in absence of that, we have asked you to donate items to the circle of care. We've been collecting those during the Lenten season and this morning. We want to bless and dedicate those gifts before they go out into our community to serve those. Would you join me now as we got you some instances in the need to feel the love, the love of Christ and the love of others. So allow these gifts that we've given to be put into the hands of these foster families so that they may bless the children just as Jesus in his own ministry did, inviting them to come and receive a blessing when others wanted to shut them out. It's in the name of that Christ that we pray and offer these gifts this day. It's in his name. Amen. This day is our calling to go into the world, scattered to the ends of the earth to love as Christ's love and to serve in the name of Christ. It is our calling to remember, even in our darkest hour, who we are. We remember that Christ is always with us. And we remember that on this day, we were taught how to love. On this day, eternity begins and the fullness of God's reign begins to spill into our lives. So go into the world to give yourselves for others. 
in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, go into the world in love in the name of the one who loved you till the end. It all begins and ends and begins again with love. That is the story. Amen and amen. Thank you.